So Sarri's perfect example going to Bordeaux. So I didn't have Bordeaux anywhere near the Champions Cup until they smoked Sarri's. And then Sarri's come out of the Six Nations, yep. smoke Quins at the Tottenham Stadium, not very good against Saints, Northampton, yeah. but kind of in it. And then get the pants pulled down in Bordeaux. Yeah, it's been... It's been I watched the game last weekend first against, um, against Saints on the Friday night. And I thought the one against Quins, they were emotionally there and at it when they, you know, I know it was... Farrell's 250th game. There was a big occasion at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Um, big rivalry. So I think that emotionally they were there. And then I watched them the week afterwards and they looked, not not that they didn't want to be there, but you you know what it's like. Well, defence is their main yeah, thing and they were just and off. They were, they were way off it. And I, I say way off it, probably only about 15, 20, you know, 15%. But you know how much of a difference that makes, especially when you're playing a team who, on the other side of the, the coin, in terms of Saints, were fully charged and ready to go back after losing to Bristol. So, so I didn't think it was probably the best preparation for Saris going into an away game, uh, knockout rugby against Bordeaux. And I think probably what they were probably still reeling a little bit from that heavy defeat in the group stages. Probably mentally, they were thinking it's a tough place to come and win. Yeah, the crowd are on top of you, thirty-three thousand people in the stadium, and. They were never really in it, were they? Mm. I, I mean, I know the score, but it was actually only, I think it was only 10 nil at half time or 10 3. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was 10 nil. 10 nil. Yeah. So even at 10 nil, you still felt, you know, I think Bordeaux had three or four tries disallowed. So you sort of felt like 10 nil was a result for Saris at half time. And then obviously the the 20 minutes after half time, they just got blown away. Where Damn Saris it. are normally good. Where they're normally half good. As well. but, but they, Bordeaux's attack, but I mean, Peno was incredible. I know he didn't get on the score sheet, but just the amount of defenders he beats every single week is incredible. Um, the I mean, Luku looks looks a different player when he plays with Bordeaux compared to the Six Nations he's had. And they just look a really, really strong team. And I get to take some beer. But Sarri's just looked, again, they looked off it. Once they went down, you just never felt like they were coming back, did you? It felt, it felt like it was just one-way traffic. And... Um, I think I think that will be a concern for Saris. I think though I think a week off will be will be good for those boys. A lot of boys who have obviously played a lot of minutes during the Six Nations have had to back up two or three weeks. They looked they looked a little bit tired against Saints the week before, and they looked very tired in that second half against Bordeaux. So I think a week off will do them really good and uh, and coming back next week. I think do, do you sort of see Bordeaux as as a challenger, Jim, for this year's competition after sort of sneaking under the radar a little bit before that win against Saris, didn't they? Have to. And the fact that they've got Quins, yep. I'm not saying Quins don't travel well, but they are up and down. Because you look at players like Penno, like Luku that you mentioned yep. as well. Mo, uh, what's his name? Moafana. 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 Biel Bielare. I can struggle to say his name. He is like as in cheat code. Yeah. But it's hard because they've got Quins at home. Yep. Quins up and down like they are Jekyll and Hyde. If you go based on Saracens, absolutely hosing Quins yeah, if you looked at it yeah, like yeah. that. But Sarri's like just looking at some of the stats, missed 42 tackles, conceded 16 turnovers. Uh, about 40 of them were on Pano, I think, were they? Yeah. Is it, do you know what I mean? So it's kind of, it's, and maybe it's the bogey, well, it is the bogey team yeah. for them. But when you look at it and you said that if their, their running will be all in France yeah. up to the final at the Tottenham Stadium and the kind of players that we've just profiled there and the fact that you've got Damien Penno, who I think is the form winger He's brilliant, in the he? world at the minute, I, I always called him Moneyball. Like my yeah. mate, I don't because Moneyball's if you get a player cheap, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. And he over, I wouldn't imagine he's that cheap. No, that's <laughs> all I mean. So he's not cheap, but, <laughs> but I, I, I know I what think, you mean. Yeah. But his stats, like Penno's in the game, producer Rob, I'll read them: fourteen carries, thirteen defenders beaten, three offloads, and a try assist, no try. Yeah, so, he he is honestly he's. It's quite funny because when we play, when we used to play against Penno for for Wales, we used to sort of there never used to be. You just couldn't analyze him because he pops up in so many different positions. He's not hes not really a winger. He's almost just like a utility player on the, he's like a hybrid on the field because he's got, he's so good in those close quarters where he beats, he's beating front five defenders, getting offloads, stepping players, covering in the backfield, getting teams out, of, his team out of trouble. And he's just a phenomenal rugby player. Uh, like I said, I don't even class him so much as an actual winger, if that makes sense, because he's roamed so much and the amount of work he gets through. So, yeah, look, if he stays in in the kind of form he's in at the minute, with like I said, with Jalibert to come back, um, they're going to take some serious beating, especially in southwest of France, no doubt. Do Quinns have a chance? We're going to review and preview. Uh, preview and review the whole do way Do Quinns have a chance? Y yes, because if Quinns decide, if Quinns have one of their days, they can rip up any defence in world rugby. But I think, 
like you said, Jim, they've been a little bit too up and down over the last few weeks. To if you, if you are down against Bordeaux in Bordeaux with that crowd on top of you, the form they're in, the game's going to be probably too too far gone even for a team like Quinn. So I, I think Bordeaux will be heavily heavily fit, heavily strong favourites for that one yeah and Glasgow gave them a proper mm. game Glasgow a good team Glasgow a good team they're not a great team they're a good team and this is the levels right as in we know having played at the Champions Cup Bordeaux are a great team yeah so that is the difference if you go based on that because Quinns are at home and if it wasn't for a few decisions Glasgow could have won that game yeah. and, they, and they didn't get the rub of the green they didn't get the decisions the number I don't want to go through them all but they were hard done by, but Glasgow should have beat Quinns. Yeah, as well. and, and Quinns sort of switched off a little bit, didn't they? After going, what was it, twenty-one-seven up, all of a sudden, then Glasgow come back twenty-four, twenty-one up, and just played some brilliant rugby. Played in the right areas of the pitch. I thought George Holm was actually really good on, on the weekend. Um, great to have Tua Pilato back for them as well. He makes it makes, a, big makes a huge difference. He's going to make a difference to any team he mm. plays in, clearly. So, so and yeah, like I said, obviously Qu Quinns got over in the last couple of minutes with the driving mall try and. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I just I just feel like, like I said, Quinns have been too inconsistent, and against a team in banging form like Bordeaux, going to to the southwest of France, I just think that you can't be as loose as what Quinns are. Otherwise, the game's going to be too far behind. And um, but I think I think it's going to be a cracker of a game. Both teams are going to want to play. Uh, Marcus Smith, to be fair, has been brilliant, hasn't he? The last few weeks since coming back from from international duty. So, what level is he, uh, Marcus Smith? Now, like, is he ha at the international level? Because he hasn't really had a run, and yeah. these games, bigs, are the ones, aren't they? As in, to be really like your Owen Farrells, like I, even, I think, even, yeah. I, I, I think Jim, in answer to that, nobody nobody can question how talented Marcus is. He's one of the most talented rugby players on the planet. But probably what England will want a little bit more from him is in terms of that control of the game, because he's you know the way Quinns play, it's very helter skeltery, isn't it? And um, I think they'll probably just want a little bit more control. So when you go twenty one seven up at home against Glasgow, you don't really want to have to win that again. You should you shouldn't have to win that again from that, that position. So you you look you ha naturally you look at your nine and your ten and think right could we, how could we have managed the game a bit better? Could we have played a little bit more territory? Could we have just put our foot on the brake a little bit and said to Glasgow, you know, come and attack us and let's let's try and find a different way to win? But in terms of a talented rugby player, there's very few better than him. I saw Danny Kerr be interviewed before the game and just sort of said how he's a once in a generation player, and I believe that. But that doesn't mean, especially at an international level, you kind of, you sort of need, you need those moments, but you probably need to be six, seven out of 10 every week, which is what probably George Ford has done in his in his career, which is why he's had the amount of caps he's had. So um, I think Marcus, again, he he's only going to, you're only going to find that out about Marcus if he has a run and he's been unlucky with injury and he's had some tough times in terms of having to come in and play fullback a little bit when, when George Ford there and... Um, so, so, so I do think he's been a little bit unlucky, but I think he's as a rugby player is there's very few better than him. But as a as a as a ten who who maybe the way England want to play a little bit, um, they probably just need to need to look at that, those games where they they're gonna have to, they can't win games twice all the time. Yeah, so it's maybe like the Quade Cooper, you know, back yeah, in the day. Yeah, like, as in bit. he was just a, a freak, wasn't he? Brilliant. But, but but and, and you know maybe with the way Quinns play that maybe doesn't help Marcus in terms of the way that they play and they're encouraged for that. But um, as a talent, he's incredible, yeah. absolutely incredible. But he's he's coming under a, a bit of pressure from Finn Smith. At, at well, that, I was going to well, come on to that. Onto that because because Finn is actually showing some real maturity in his game, not just you know he's got some lovely plays and he's got some lovely um, some lovely f sort of moments, but he's showing some real maturity beyond his age, and and that's sort of probably what the the England coaches will want to see a little bit more, maybe from from Marcus in terms of that, you know. But Finn Finn Smith, speaking of Northampton and Munster, was was excellent again yesterday. And we'll we'll come straight on to that because we both are saying Bordeaux against Quinns at the weekend. I, I would be very surprised if Bordeaux didn't didn't go through. Yeah, yeah. But he, but the Northampton thing that you were talking about and mentioning Finn Smith there, you asked him the question, and I was watching it the way that Northampton beat Munster. And Munster, like you heard, there was loads of illness in the camp. I didn't realise that. I wondered why RG Snyman wasn't playing again. Yeah, but, but he was a big miss as well. But yeah. he was a big miss. But they played really well. Mm. Like regardless of the, the the sickness or whatever, they brought a real yeah. dogged game plan where Northampton had to 
have, and you used this analogy with Scotland before, around a plan B. Mm. And that's where I'm a big on Finn Smith as well. The attacking, like defensively very good, but the game management and having to show that yeah. actually shows that Northampton... Like they've got a chance in this tournament because they can play two different yeah, ways. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think I actually spoke, I was on the field, I spoke to a few of the, I spoke to Sam Vesti, the attack coach, I spoke to obviously Phil Dowson, the director of rugby and a couple of players. And they actually said how, how poor they attacked by Saints' standard yesterday in terms of their game and how they actually attacked. So what was, what was pleasing? I asked Phil Dowson in the aftermatch there, I said, was it more pleasing or is it more pleasing that you're finding a different way to win games, a very untraditional way of, of winning games for a Saints point of view. And he sort of said it's the maturity and the t people like Finn Smith, like Alex Mitchell, who are who are finding, figuring out ways to win games because everybody knows that Saints, if you allow them to play this freestyle, playing uh, free-flowing rugby, they're going to carve you to pieces. But I just thought that the, the last 20 minutes, actually what they just did was they just won the game ugly. I mean, they scored a brilliant try to get them ahead. Brilliant, brilliant try. Something that they've worked. That that play has been in the in the locker book since the George Hendy one. The George Hendy first one. Scotsman. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, Look I'm, Scottish. I, I was going to say <laughs> there must be some Scottish in it. One hundred percent. But that play has been in the playbook for um, since the first day I joined. So it's exactly the same play they've run, and it's no coincidence that they've run it so well because Sam Vesti just gets them running the same plays attacking in different channels all the time and it's and he he deserves i think he deserves huge huge credit because he is for me the best attack coach that's out there the best attack coach that's out there and the way that he has brought on all these players and and there's no coincidence that finn smith's been at the club for what, just over a year now 18 months maybe and you can see his game has gone up huge amounts and I and I, I believe that obviously he's playing in a good team but he's he's being coached by one of the best coaches that's out there as well and um, just the way that he drove that team in the second half I just thought was brilliant some of his moments and just the game maturity and he looked he, he didn't look like a 21 year old outside half yesterday did he? can't believe he's 21 does it does, yeah. doesn't look like a 21 year old outside half so he's got a huge credit and he's going to be knocking on the door do you think he could overtake Marcus Smith because well, well, he's got that all round game yeah absolutely I, got, I, I don't see any reason why he could couldn't be ahead of Marcus in the pecking order. But but I think Marcus is always going to be in the conversation because of how talented he is. But I think if Finn keeps driving Northampton, you know, maybe into a semi-final of Europe and getting to show that talent and that game management and that maturity on a big stage week in, week out, then he's got every chance of putting pressure on George Ford, on, on Marcus, who, and, and, you know, George Ford isn't playing a huge amount at the minute as well. So... Maybe this summer is a really good, I know it's a pretty tough tour they've got to New Zealand, but do they do they say, well, we need to find out a little bit about Marcus and Finn, at the, even at this early age, against the very best? So it'd be interesting to see which way they go. Yeah, Northampton are interesting though, because it feels like it's now or never for them because of Courtney. I, I was just, yeah. Waller. Who else got announced? Uh, Ludlam. Uh, Ludlam's Ludlam, obviously off to France uh, as well. Paul Hill. Paul, Paul Hill was off to, know, he's going to be Scottish. Scottish, Edinburgh. But it does feel like, like now. He was complaining yesterday. I spoke to him yesterday. He was complaining <laughs> about the house prices in Edinburgh as well. A so lot. He, he's, he said he's having an absolute nightmare trying to find a place. Really? I've got a mate, Craig from Revere. We'll, we'll, sort him we'll, out. Put, him, we'll, we'll put him in touch. touch. Yeah, we'll put him in touch. Um, yeah, I agree with that, Jim. I think that's a really good point because you take those, even those four or five players we've mentioned on top of a lot of other squad players, that are, you know, and you know how important squad players are. And you think, does that team, can that team do the same next year as what they're doing at the minute without those players? And you'd have to probably argue, you'd have to think it would be it would be challenging, wouldn't it? Because defence was an Achilles heel for Northampton. Yeah. He, and you look at Lewis Ludlam and Courtney. Courtney. Massive. Yeah. Massive defenders for them. And, and I think Lee Radford deserves a huge credit. And I spoke to, again, I spoke to a few of the players before and after the game and I asked them, I, I sort of knew the answer before I asked the question, but I said, what's he been like? Has he been, you know, overcomplicating things or has he been flooding it with information? And he said, just, he's worked on the end, the mentality and keeping things really simple. And, and that's what defense is. Defense is 90% if you want to do it. And probably in the previous three or four years, not saying that Northampton as a, as a team didn't want to defend, but it was always, well, if you score, 35 we'll score 39 and it was almost a bit like well it's not that important to us whereas you look at the games now and 
I'd say it's their, their defense has won them probably more games than their attack this year. Their, the way that they've matured in terms of, like we spoke about Finn Smith, bringing that level of maturity on top of a rock solid defense. And they're not having to score 39 points in a game to win now. They're having to score whatever it was, 24 yesterday in a knockout game against Munster. Limited Munster to just two tries. So um, I think he deserves a huge credit. And a little bit, I said, I said it's exactly the same as what Sean Edwards does. Sean Edwards, everyone thinks Sean Edwards is this mastermind and comes up with all these brilliant schemes and plans. And he is the simplest coach. Oh, you'll ever, yeah. <laughs> Literally, he is the simplest defense coach, but he is absolutely nothing short of spectacular. The best defense coach that's ever been out there for me because he gets people to want to defend. And that sometimes is that sometimes is a challenge because you you've played you I'm sure you played with players Jim who thought oh, defense is sort of the last thing they want to be practicing after training they everyone wants to be kicking or passing or line up throwing whatever so I think he deserves a huge amount of credit for bringing that mentality into the club um, and I think the coaches deserve credit because they've obviously seen that that was like you said Jim the Achilles heel um, and they look really strong uh, and I think another home quarter final next week against the Bulls. Who've got to travel. Who've got to travel. I, I, it was interesting because I, I don't know what you think on this, but if that game's in Pretoria, I make the Bulls fairly heavy favourites. Altitude. At altitude, having to travel, the Bulls record there. But with the game being in Northampton, I make Northampton quite yeah, heavy favourites. I do as well. So, so it's kind of, it, it goes back to that conversation we had at the start, doesn't it? Is it, is can the format be be better for especially when you include the South African teams but I, I think Northampton have got a huge chance to make a semi-final and maybe it is better because we're like now I'm thinking right okay Northampton on a six day turnaround yep. the Bulls absolutely smoked Leon. yes it weren't an amazing game the Bulls have got some quality players yep. Curtly Aaron Sir Willie LaRue well, yeah. Enric Lowe in the background. David Creel at 12 Creel, is, is just that, absolutely carved do you know what I mean just, they've yep. got some quality players <clears throat> But with the travel, and maybe that does add to it. I yeah. don't know. There, there may be an element of the Bulls who may be just thinking, they may try and just simplify that game next week against Northampton. They may just come and say, right, we're going to scrum and maul you and kick the leather off the ball and squeeze you. Because I think, and then when they get their opportunity to bring guys like Caden Moody and Willie Leroux and these guys. I didn't even say Caden Moody as yeah. well. I was, I was looking for like the list of names that they've got. So, like, so proper. I think, I think th this is a proper team that are coming to Franklin's Gardens next weekend. But... I think home advantage will just be enough for the Saints. Um, I thought the Bulls were really good actually in that game against Leon on the way. They they sort of had the game won inside 25, 30 minutes. They went 28 7 up or whatever it was and just looked strong, forward pack, um, just winning so many collisions and looked as if a little bit like Leon had their mind on a probably a top 14 relegation battle rather than thinking that. And again, that probably goes, did did Leon generally think they could go to Pretoria and win around Well, they 16. didn't even pick the best team, did they? Well, they that's left. the thing. Yeah. And and even if they won that game, would they think that they could go to Franklin's Gardens and beat Northampton? So that that's kind of the, 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 the point for me is that there's a lot of teams in that knockout stage which probably didn't think, if they were being brutally honest with themselves, that they could go and win those games, let alone the tournament, maybe. Yeah, it was... Joshua to us over, is he at Leon? No, so he's, got, he's gone to Rassin now. He's at Rassin. Rassin. He's been yeah. injured since the World Cup, okay. so he hasn't actually played for Rassin, so, um, which is good because Toulon have played them twice already this season. <laughs> so I don't fancy I don't fancy him coming back um, onto the field when I'm involved. But um, yeah, so it should, be, it should be a great match next weekend, Saturday night. Um, but I do, I fancy Saints at home. Can they go all the way? Can they go all the way? And I, I say all the way to a final. So if, because we know it's a one-off game. I think, again, I think it matters what happens in the, the other quarterfinal. If Leinster win and Saints have got to go to Leinster in a semi-final, I think it will be very difficult for them. If they're playing at Stadium MK against La Rochelle, then I think they've got clearly a much better chance. Why? So, but, but because I think a home advantage, I think they'll have, they'll have, have just like, Oh, okay, because they'll play at they'll the play MK Because they stadium. were higher seed than... Yes, of course. Um, higher seed than La Rochelle. So I believe that, I think if Leinster win and, the, and, and Northampton win, I think Leinster will be strong favourites to win a semi-final in the Aviva Stadium. If La Rochelle get the job done over Leinster, which is clearly possible after the last few years' results... I think Northampton will fancy that clearly being half an hour down the road in MK. Do you agree with it being at MK? 
and, and this is someone who loves having games at Tottenham Stadium and out with the game, but out with the stadiums from the team. But Franklin's Gardens, like the pitch, yeah, I think, I think if it's it was a, shame, a nighttime it's a shame, game, it's a shame that, that it's not there. But I think the semi-finals have to be in yes, in uh, home advantage, is it? Or yeah. Home country advantage is what it is, isn't it? So, so I think probably that's the best and easiest solution for Saints to take a game there. Um, so, I, so I do, I do believe that it it has a big impact that first quarter final and whether Saints can go all the way to a final, yeah. Yeah, when you look at the stats on Feyre Boso, just from the weekend, 15 carries, 106 metres made, 12, 12 defenders beaten. Uh, i got to be honest, I'm actually surprised it's not more than that. It, yeah. it felt like it was more when you're watching the game. But it's, it? it's not even the, the beating the defender, is it? It's like the metres after. Yeah. In, like, again, we, we've mentioned it, but that then metres <clears> around. And, and quite often, sometimes those stats can be misleading from a back three point of view because obviously the wingers are catching it deep mm. and bringing it back but there wasn't a huge amount of that in his game on the weekend was there so those meters were hard earned meters as well um, so England have England have got themselves a a very very good player yeah. uh, in that but just on that a shout out to Ethan Roots as well 28 carries in the game as well uh, so he he was he was great do you see the celebrations after and this is how I view rugby right is I'm looking for like stuff off the ball and yeah. after the game so when they all jumped into each other after I, there was a, an Alistair Strokos Joe Andrew I don't know if you uh, remember yeah, it yeah, yeah, where yeah, they the, collided the, the heads. The heads there yeah. was one at the weekend so Feyre really? yeah. has gone straight into Vincent and he's on the floor after I think he broke his nose because oh. <laughs> Feyre Wabosa has jumped into him but he's good for Exeter been brilliant Vincent Vincent, Vincent the, uh, delivering pizza a couple of a few months Alan ago a story Hell of a story, of a story. But again, just gifted a, a, athlete. Yeah, a, dynamic, quick, little bit, a little bit in the mould of a Sam Simmons type mm, of player. Exactly. You know what I mean? So they've sort of replaced like for like ish in that in that sense. So yeah, again, Exeter. I, I, I thought Exeter had blown it to be honest, because that wind was so strong on the weekend, so so strong in terms of some of the. I mean, some of the conversion attempts and some of the box kick attempts were just you know they were laughable, weren't they? In terms of in terms of that. So I thought to go in at 12-5 down at halftime after having that strong a wind. Um, but I thought the second half, again, Feo Boso came to the fore, Vincent came to the fore, just Ethan Roots came to the fore, just knocking and knocking and knocking on the door. Like old school yeah, Exeter. Yeah, it was old school, yeah. Oh, that, was, that was an Exeter performance of sort of five, six yeah. years ago. Um, just getting the job done in the 20... They seem to just spend all the time in the 22, just picking and going... Even to the point where I think the, if you saw it right on half time, they had literally had five guys over and they just continued to pick and go and pick and go. And um, I thought at that point the game was gone. And Bar I thought, actually thought Bath clearly didn't help them losing Finn Russell so early on. Yeah. But but I, I, I thought Bath managed that first half really, really well. And to go in 12 5 ahead was a big plus. And I thought they'd, they'd see it home then. But I thought Exeter, like I said, just rolled the sleeves up into that into that wind in the second half crowd got behind them um and they just looked they looked fit and they looked strong they looked they, they looked they looked the better team in the end and um yeah some match you forget they're champions they won it during covid didn't yeah. they so like hoggy i completely forgot i was chatting to Stuart hoggy he's like oh when we won the champions cup i was like looking at it. i was like oh yeah you actually did yeah. but no one remembers covid do they but but there's, there's i think they're they're very much in a in a transition period aren't they mm. they've got a lot of young players who are clearly clearly going to be very good players you know your Chris Jinsers your, your Dav Jenkins your, your Vincents your, your guys like that but they probably need to spend two three four seasons a little bit like what Northampton have done in terms of they've kept that core group together for three four five years and now it's kind of paying dividends whereas I think Exeter at the minute are probably in a little bit of that stage. Are they good enough to win the Premiership or to win the the Champions Cup? Right now, I, I'm i not sure. But I think if they keep that group together, you can tell that they're building something and they've obviously got a track record of producing very, very good players and, and Championship winning teams. So I think I think they've probably got the toughest test going away to Toulouse on the, uh, this weekend. Yeah. Um, you know, look, they... they They'll have belief in the in their own group, but I think I think Toulouse will 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 be relatively comfortable on on, on the weekend. Yeah, agree. Pod 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 pod. Rugby pod.